control. Okay, so we move forward to the next tutorial, and it's a big pleasure to introduce Richard, who's going to tell us everything about the logic of decision, I think. So thanks, Richard. Um, okay, so the, this exercise is part uh, pedagogical and part ideological, uh, or polemical. Uh, my, 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 uh, I, I mean, at least one of the goals in my uh, intellectual life is to try and convince you know, more than one economist that there's something interesting about the Bolker Jeffrey framework for doing decision theory. So uh, if I can convince one of you, that will be the one that I've managed to do so, because uh, after 15 years, I've had no success so far. Uh, the only one I, I think uh, agreed with me was John Broom, and then he immediately switched to philosophy. So I don't know whether he can't. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, the, the, the game, the, 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 what I want to do today is essentially describe and, uh, mo describe and motivate the bolker jeffrey framework for doing decision theory. Um, and uh, uh, in, at least in part of uh, doing that is I uh, will very quickly say something about uh, why there is some need for an alternative. So I'll talk a little bit about problems for Savage. I mean, Savage here is just the kind of placeholder for the, the tradition that, that comes from him. Uh, uh, as a sort of background to defending it, then I will say something about Jeffrey's theory, and then spend a little bit of time on Ethan Bolker's representation theorem for Jeffrey's decision theory, because it's, um, I mean, a lot of, although the mathematics is not super complicated, there's probably a lot there that people are not familiar with. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that rather slowly. Um, hopefully there will then be time to look at some of the extensions, because the main argument for this framework really is its uh, fertility. I mean, there's just a lot a lot that you can do with it because the basic constituents are very simple but flexible. I mean, and this really uh, derives from the fact that your basic prospects in Jeffrey decision theory uh, are uh, propositions, and propositions can refer to really anything you like. Uh, so you can play around with the, na the nature of the propositions that you're working with and build very different kinds of decision models for very different kinds of circumstances. So I want to give you some kind of flavor for that in the last part, but. Um, I will pick out some subclass of possible topics as we get, when we get there. Please interrupt me all the way through. I mean, there's absolutely no point in me kind of just blathering on, uh, hoping that people are understanding me. I'd much rather only get a quarter of the way through the presentation and everybody's happy with what's happening than uh, get to the sort of sexy bits at the end. Right? I mean, there's, there's no grand conclusion, so there's no point in uh, stopping me. I want to start with a bit of history. I'm allowed to do that because it's in Italy. If it was an Anglophone <laughs> audience, I would, you know, I'd be shot before I got anywhere there. But I think it helps to, to situate the, um, the conversation a little bit. Okay. So uh, our space is basically what I would like to call Bernoullian decision theory. Uh, maybe it should be called Pascalian slash Bernoullian decision theory. There's a pointer on this, right? Uh, which is the point of the, the top thing? Okay. Um, so Bernoullian decision theory, uh, uh, this is the origin as I, as I see it of the concept of expected benefit. Uh, and uh, it's given rise to this grand tradition that runs through von Neumann, Savage, Anscombe, Aumann, and which culminates, or perhaps culminates, not the right word, but it reaches its contemporary apogee in the Bocconi School of Decision Sciences. So uh, this is... Uh, perhaps the dominant tradition in uh, economics and the social sciences. And really the assembly blocks here are uh, uh, the, the von Neumann-Morgenstern uh, development of expected utility theory. And then this, the, the synthesis of this, along with the subjective theory of probability, um, developed predominantly by uh, Definetti. I have to put Definetti in here again for sake of uh, uh, local tastes. And... Uh, 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 in the work of Savage, I mean, which I, you know, Savage's Foundations of Decision, uh, Foundations of Statistics, perhaps is the, you know, the central moment in the development of decision theory. And this is, I see him as the, as the synthesis of von Neumann and de Finetti. Um, okay, but then uh, von Neumann and, and uh, Savage get pulled together into a single framework by Anscombe Aumann, uh, which is very popular. I mean, we saw uh, Simone use this kind of framework extensively, uh, because it was in this, the anscombe Almond -Almond framework you can simultaneously discuss risk and uncertainty. And indeed, I think this is a, a, a much neglected feature. anscombe Almond is almost unknown to philosophers, and that's partly because 
of the tyranny of Bayesianism. I mean, this is an expression that Simone used to me last night. Um, that uh, uh, philosophers have only recently began to rediscover the virtues of thinking about both subjective and objective probability, um, but haven't done, and because this, that hasn't percolated through to philosophical decision theory, philosophical dis discussion stops here with Savage, more or less, uh, even though the economic literature has moved on. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the mainstream tradition. The tradition that I want to uh, motivate today here is the one that stems also from Bernoulli, but goes down a rather different path via Ramsey. Um, Ramsey's work predates that of von Neumann Morgenstern, and, also, and, and of course predates that of Savage. But in many ways, uh, I mean, the many features of Savage's treatment, or treatment of expected utility theory, if we can call it that, that is much more satisfactory than either of them. Um, in particular, and I'll make this point again later, uh, Ramsey and his descendants uh, don't need to make in any kinds of assumptions of state independence of utility, um, that, or rather in Ramsey they're very, very local assumptions of state independence. It gives much more satisfactory foundations. To, uh, there are nonetheless features of Ramsey which are less good than Savage, in particular his treatment of the rationality axioms is um, elliptical and cavalier to a large extent. I mean, his work is driven by a measurement problem, not by a problem of rational justification. But largely those problems are settled then by the work of Richard Jeffrey, which is the work that I want to concentrate on here. So my claim is that uh, Richard Jeffrey delivers the goods that you get in this other tradition, but delivers it without the problems. Um, so that's the claim that I have to vindicate. Uh, and uh, we'll see how, whether you agree with me as we go on. Okay, there's a, a slightly different way of making the same, oh, so I can use this right. Uh, we, we can, we can present the sort of relationship logically rather than, than um, historically. So one of the ways of understanding what's happened in utility theory um, and expected utility theory is in terms of uh, development of versions of the theory which are um, suitable for different kinds of prospects. Uh, so that the, the, the sort of basic triad that decision theorists are interested in um, is the relationship between the nature of the objects that you're dealing with, and are they um, you know, sets of unstructured but disjoint alternatives like commodity bundles, are they uh, lotteries, are they acts? Uh, and for, the, for these different kinds of prospects, you expect different kinds of uh, rationality conditions to apply, uh, and then if you're given these rationality conditions on the preferences over these different kinds of prospects, then you'll get different kinds of representations. And so the other way of looking at the history is, is, through the, is, is as a sort of history of development of different kinds of representations suitable for different kinds of sets of prospects with, with, with particular structures. So just to give a, examples that will be familiar to many of you, uh, I mean, your absolute baseline results in, in utility theory look at representations of preferences over just sets of disjoint alternatives. And here we're in a, an environment in which the sort of central axiom is the ordering axiom, the completeness and transitivity. And all you can squeeze out of that are these ordinal re utility representations. The real action tends to start happening when you have these things that are, is now in the measurement literature known as a conjoint additive structure. These are really sets of prospects where you can apply some, some kind of separability axiom. And this is the workhorse really, of, of decision theory, because this is what gives you ultimately Savage's theory of decision-making and uncertainty. It also gives you some of the central results of social choice. It gives you some of the central results of intertemporal choice and so on. Uh, again, again and again, structures in which you can identify some kind of separability property, and then with the separability property, you can induce representations that are additive. And, you know, it's a nice, eat nice, bit of nice mathematical structure to work with, and so it's very, very popular. I mean, also very popular are these linear representations of lotteries. I won't, we've heard a lot about them already, so I, I won't go on about that anymore. Um, well, you, uh, the main point here is just that we can, when, when we start to look at Jeffrey, we actually move off initially in a completely different direction. Our main object of concern are not these kinds of structures, but Boolean algebras. Okay. Now, of course, Boolean algebras are do figure prominently I mean, uh, in, in the mainstream decisions theory, but only as the structure of the uh, 
the objects of the, pre of the probability relations, not as the structure of the objects of the utility relation. So what, we, what we're looking at here are Boolean algebras of prospects to which we will then attribute utilities of some kind. Um, so this is our central object of concern. And as we'll see, there's a main, there's a sort of central, there's a characteristic axiom, which will be called the averaging axiom. And it gives rise to characteristic representations, which I will call desirabilities, or they're called desirabilities, they're a type of utility. Um, and, and, and that's, this is the object that I want to describe to you. But once you've got that, of course, you can play exactly the same game as is played in the standard theory. You can keep on adding structure to your Boolean algebras. You can index them so that you have families of them, so that you can do social choice or intertemporal choice or whatever that you like. You can add some, you can put some, some separability conditions on them, and then you'll get additively separable desirabilities. You can get linear Boolean algebras, blah, 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 blah. So, um, uh, although it's true that in the Jeffrey tradition, you know, most of the work kind of started and stopped here because the, the work never really took off. Um, it, you know, there's all this enormous potential for exploiting the resources of the, of the approach that, that's yet to be done. I'll just give you some indications of how that goes. Okay, so that's just, the, those are the pictures. Um, let's, uh, let's go back to the text. All right, let's just start with Savage then. Um, all right, why should we even bother to look beyond the strand of tradition? Well, there, there are a number of well-known difficulties with the, with the... I mean, I'm going to speak very loosely of the standard approach. Of course, not all of these problems apply to all of the theories in the standard approach. There are, to each of the problems that I'll mention, there are many solutions that have been offered. I mean, this is not an attempt to be exhaustive at all. It's just to give a sort of... It's a kick... It's so muddy the water enough to persuade you that it's worth looking in a different pond for a little bit. Okay. All right, so there are these well-known violations of the sure thing principle or of the, more generally of separability conditions. Uh, it would be nice to be able to do decision theory in which separability was not a prerequisite to get anything interesting out of it. And one of the problems with the standard tradition in a way is that there's this huge gap between merely ordinal utility and the sort of additive utility structures that you get once you introduce separability. Separability is terribly strong, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have something in between? That's the, the thought here. Even if there are cases in which independence is, is uh, sensible or reasonable. Okay. All right, but that's not really, oops, okay. Um, that's perhaps not where the focus of where I want to put the criticism. I, 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 the main worry that I have with the standard position is really uh, have to do, do with uh, state the, the state dependence of the utility functions and, uh, and, and associated problems. So one of the best sources of kind of insight on this issue is a very famous letter of Robert Alman to, uh, to, uh, to Savage, in which he, and, and Savage's reply, and you can get this letter actually up on the web, it's, it's reproduced in one of Drez's books, but it's also, I think, up available on the website of um, the Rationality Center in, in Jerusalem. Um, I, you know, I, I recommend it to read. So, uh, in this letter, Alman puts you know, a very kind of simple example to Savage, in which he says, well, slightly modifying the example, he says, imagine you're given a choice between two acts. Um, act one gives you a, an umbrella whenever it's raining and nothing when it's not raining. And act two gives you uh, 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 nothing when it's raining and an umbrella when it's not. And suppose that probability for, for rain is 50%. Okay. Which of these two acts would you prefer? And of course, uh, Alman suggests that Savage and any sane person would prefer the act which gives you the umbrella when it's raining. Right? But uh, naively, Savage's theory tells you you should be indifferent between the two of these because the states of the world are equiprobable and the consequences are, uh, are the same but sort of in different states of the world. Right, and of course the point is here is that an umbrella is no good to you when it's not raining, it's very useful to you when it's raining. Uh, and so we can't really think of umbrella as a true consequence. Right? And that of course is the natural reply here. But you can see that once you start making that reply, there's actually no, no point at which you can ever stop. I mean, what, whatever whenever you declare what your consequences are, some clever person will come along and describe an act in which that's that consequence really depends on the, nat on the state of the world, and so the, the savage, uh, you'll get indifferences in savage's position, in, 
in Savage's picture, which are, are not real indifferences, as it were. Well, Savage's move in, in this is to, is to declare consequences in the last analysis and experience. I mean, his thought is that if we, if we think of uh, consequences of act ultimately as, you know, your, your experience, your, your, uh, I think, I mean, he thinks of it as a kind of something like your hedonic response in the final instance, right? Your, your measure of its pain or pleasure. But even this will not do. I mean, it's superficially attractive, but it won't do. I mean, it's quite clear, for instance, that many hedonic states are state-dependent. The utilities are state-dependent. I mean, imagine experiencing joy during a funeral versus experiencing joy during a birthday party. I mean, many of us would say that we prefer the latter because we regard the former as highly inappropriate. So even our own hedonic responses uh, are subject to state-dependent preferences. Variation. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, and for a deeper conceptual reason too, I think it's, it's unsatisfactory because as you begin to mix up um, consequences as features of the world with your own, or the, the subject's evaluation of these things. So th this won't, really won't do. Um, uh, and the problem, although uh, the, there is, of course, versions of Savage in which state dependence is removed, it does quite a great deal of damage to the formal structure of Savage's theory. Right, well, once you have, uh, uh, once you acknowledge the possibility of state-dependent utilities, uh, that messes up the attribution of probabilities. Um, Armand's own example here is another nice example. He imagines a, 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 a Professor X, whose wife is undergoing a dangerous operation, uh, and for which she only has a 50% chance of survival. And uh, Armand asks Savage, if you were Professor X, would you prefer to bet on your, you know, $100 on your wife's survival of this operation or on the toss of a fair coin. And he says, quite reasonably, Professor X might prefer to bet on the toss of the fair coin um, because, well, if his wife dies, the money is not worth anything to him, so what does he care? On the other hand, you know, I mean, if, assuming that the coin toss is independent, uh, in the other case, there's the possibility that she survives and he's got 100 pounds, they can go out and they can celebrate for dinner. So clearly, there, the, uh, uh, the utility dependence matters very much. And the point is here is that you were, if you were trying to use the fair coin uh, as a way of calibrating the probabilities of the wife's survival, your subjective probabilities for your wife's survival, um, you, would, you would be forced to in, infer from the preference for a bet on the... Uh, uh, on the coin over that of the, the wife's survival, that your subjective probabilities for your wife's survival is actually lower than 50%. But by hypothesis, that's not the real situation. So you're going to get, because of the state dependence, you're going to get attributions of false. I mean, the method of revealed preference, if you like, is going to give, lead to attribution of false beliefs under this circumstance. Well, Savage has an answer to this, and his answer is, well, you know, we have to, we have to think of... Uh, what we really have to do is we have to give him acts in which not only does his wife survive the operation, but she dies, you know, so that we can equalize things out and so on. Uh, and to the charge that this in, in requires that we introduce impossible acts, because now we're, we're required not only to have acts in which things have their normal consequences, but when you're now required to have acts, for instance, in which someone, as Savage colorfully puts it, is hung till, by their neck until they die, but live a happy life thereafter. Um, you, Savage says, well, you know, although this, these impossible acts, um, I mean, although these acts are impossible, but necessary for my construction, they're just like something like construction lines in geometry. I mean, they're, they're hypothetical. We introduce them in order to get measurements. But again, I think this is not very satisfactory. Um, there's a very, uh, for the, when, once you start introducing things like this, um, you get into serious problems uh, making sense of individuals' behavior when presented with particular alternatives because now you have really no idea at all how they're viewing the acts which you, which you present them. So it's built into the savage framework and indeed built into the entire tradition that the objects over which you have preferences like the acts and so on um, are unambiguous. I mean, I don't mean unambiguous in the, in the sense in which Simone was talking about it, but you know what their consequences are. It's part of the description of the thing. But once you start to allow yourself uh, 
uh, all, this, the subject to entertain all kinds of crazy causal connections between things. You lose, your capacity, you, you lose the possibility of inferring from the presentation of alternative. You lose your ability to infer from that to anything about how the subject is viewing that alternative. So to take a kind of case which is different from these, but which has been quite important in the literature too, uh, to make Savage's theory work, um, you need to assume that the states of the world, I mean, what is to be a state of the world in Savage's framework is, is to be, in part, probabilistically independent of the, of the, of the choice of the action. Right? I mean, if it's not probabilistically independent of the choice of the action, then you can't get these separability conditions to work anymore. Um, but uh, whether or not something is probabilistically independent is supposed to be the outcome of the theory, not a an assumption of the theory. I mean, the theory is supposed to tell us how to attribute states to the world. So that shouldn't be one of the it shouldn't be built into the assumptions. And of course, as we know, I mean, uh, uh, state you know what counts as a, as a probabilistic independent state for one person is a consequence for another. I mean, for me, uh, uh, the fact that it's raining is a state of the world. It's causally independent of my actions, but for a witch doctor or a shaman, the fact that it's raining is not a consequence. It's, I mean, it's not a state, it's not a state of the world, it's a consequence. It's a consequence of, you know, some particular bit of magic that they can perform and so on. So th this, this distinction between, I mean, if I can sort of summarize the one, the distinction between acts and, and con uh, between states and consequences, which carries with it this distinction on the one hand between probabilistic independence and utility independence is a purely pragmatic distinction. Right? It's one that's worth introducing when you're modeling particular conditions, but it shouldn't be there at the level of the fundamentals of the theory. Um, all right, so that's uh, uh, reasons, I think. All of those are reasons for looking, trying to look at the problem slightly differently, trying to start again. So let me now describe very briefly Jeffrey's framework and then show why... Um, it avoids these problems, and then we can look before moving on to some of the details. In, the, in its basics, the framework is exceedingly simple. We just have a state, S, of, sets of, of, of states of the world, possible worlds, as philosophers like to say. Could be infinite, could be finite, doesn't really matter. I mean, in the moment, later, it'll, we'll force it to be infinite, but for the moment, it doesn't matter. Um, and then our real object of concern, these subsets of S, which we're going to call propositions. There are your events, right? Those are, our, those are our objects of interest. Actually, states of the world will drop out later. I mean, all that matters are the propositions. Um, and notice, uh, or not notice, uh, consequences don't occur formally in this theory. They're just a special kind of proposition. Right? There are the propositions that in a particular consequence, in a particular setup, you take to be the outcomes of what you're doing. Very, very, very simple framework. There's not much more to it now. So uh, just as a, as a kind of preliminary, let's just stick, let's just sort of work with a finite set of states um, so that we can see what we can do with things like that. And let's just suppose, we'll talk about where these come from later, that we have a kind of a probability mass function and a utility on the set of states. Right? Now just armed with that, there are three interesting measures that we can define. Um, of course, the there may and indeed are more, but it turns out these are really the ones that do all the work that we will, that you could possibly want to do with it. Well, there's our old friend, the probability measure. You know what that is. It's just getting a measure on the propositions by adding up the probability mass on each of the worlds inside that proposition. Okay. There's a thing called to total utility, which drops out of the picture eventually, but it's interesting to consider. Total, the total utility is a signed measure on the space of propositions. Okay, because it can take negative values as well. Um, and, it's some, and like a probability, it's just simply, it's just simply attained by summing up the utilities of the states. Okay? So it's the pair, it's the matching pair for the probability. Yeah, can I ask Richard? The alphas, there, the the sets, the events. You, 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 you sum them over, so you assume that they're kind of independent or something. No, uh. The alphas are independent, right? The, the sets. So, so, so oh, right, big states in alpha. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, thanks. So. Yeah. 
Um, all right, let me say something briefly about acts before coming back to the uh, to how we obtain these measures in a more formal setting. So, lost my. Uh, so for Jeffrey, uh, the actions are just propositions that can be made true at will. So again, it's not the distinction between acts and other kind of propositions is not a logical distinction; it's a pragmatic one. So in any particular circumstance, you have to decide for yourself as an agent what you, what your acts are. And that's sort of outside the theory in a sense. I'll comment on that in a little bit. Um, the central claim is that rational action is desirability maximizing. Okay? Rather, than, I mean, so this is your this is your correlative expected utility, uh, where desirability maximizing uh, that just means you should make true the proposition alpha that maximizes relative to any prop partition of propositions, the gamma i's, uh, which we can think of as the consequences. Okay? But it's, it's, this is true for any arbitrary partition, so it doesn't really matter. You maximize um, this, uh, this function, this, this formula here. What does this say? Well, it says your desirability of a proposition is just a probability weighted average. Here's your probability weightings. So we'll get to that in a second. An average of all the possible ways that that action can come true. Okay? So that when I go to the beach, it could be raining, it could be sunny, it could be hail, it could be snow, whatever. Those are my gamma eyes. Should I go to the beach? Well, let me think about how good it is to be at the beach under all of those circumstances. I'm at the beach and it's raining, I'm at the beach and it's sunny, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And for each of those possibilities, I just average by the conditional probability of that uh, partition element being the true one, given that I perform the act. Now, th this is the important part, because this is where the efficaciousness of the act comes in here. We want acts, we want to, we want to perform acts that make the desirable consequences more probable. And that's what's being captured by the conditional probability here. That's really the, what's doing the work here. Okay. So unlike in the Savage's theory, where we, make, we want to make, p p get the actions with desirable consequences, taking the states as fixed, here we just, the states and the consequences get merged together. So we don't look at the unconditional expectation of utility, but in effect we look at the conditional expected utility of the consequences, given the performance of the action. Huh? That's really the heart of the difference. Um, let me point out, and I won't discuss this at all, that uh, this theory is very controversial in philosophy. There is examples like Newcomb's paradox and so on, which call into question, where that was not supposed to happen, um, that call into question the appropriateness of this is the measure of causal efficacy. I will say no more about it, but that's a, a disclaimer. Um, on the positive side, let me note, Firstly, that the theory gives partition-independent prescriptions. So the ordering it induces on the acts is completely independent of the partitioning of consequences that you choose. And this is completely unlike Savage's theory, which is completely partition-dependent. It's dependent on your choice of states and it's dependent on your choice of consequences. And if you don't get that right, you'll get the wrong answer. So this is, does much better in that respect. Secondly, the desirability of the consequences so is automatically state dependent, because there is no distinction between states and consequences. So all the logical cons cons connections between propositions become vehicles by which desirability or utility is transmitted automatically. Uh, thirdly, there are no subjectively impossible acts in this story. I mean, partly because what it is for an act is for you to subjectively decide that it's possible. I mean, that's what gives you the act. But perhaps a bit more deeply, because acts really are being identified with a subjective probability over consequences. So, I mean, each of you decides, each agent decides what's possible. It's not imposed on them. So there, so there are no, no subjectively impossible acts. It might be objectively impossible. People might think they can fly. But if they think they can fly, then that's an act in their space. But otherwise, it's not. All right, so those are three good reasons to prefer Jeffrey's theory over anything out of the savage. Mm. Mm. Well, you're independent of partitions, but the partitions depend on the choice of language. Uh, well, because that yeah. depends on what you count as a sentence. Or a well, it's it fairly exceptional in the moment, right? I mean, so it will depend on whether you do it, whether you treat propositions as sentences or whether you just treat them as sets of 
states of the world. Um, and so I, I wanted to complete the expansion in part because then I had no language to handle things. And we don't even have to specify what the atoms are, because no, there aren't any. Um, I'm just going to read that in So we're looking at any other questions at this point? I mean, the technicalities are going to go up a notch now, right? and sort of very close to the end of the touchy feely part of this. Are you going to put in a more structure and maybe talk about dynamic choice? I'm not going to talk about dynamic choice. I'm going to, say, I'm going to put in some more structure. My feeling is that this is particularly useful for dynamic choice. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, you, can see, uh, and you can see intuitively why, right? Because your. your Boolean algebra is not going to get messed around by things like conditioning and propositions and so on. And you can update your desirabilities in exactly the same way that you update your uh, probabilities. So you don't have to re-describe the state space of any point or anything. So that's, that's true. I think it is particularly useful, but I actually want to say anything about I will add a different kinds of structure. Anything else before I go on? Okay. Let me say something about Boolean algebras. I mean, I, I, maybe this is all, you know, I, so it's hard to know exactly at what level to, to pitch this. But so you stop me if it's, if it's, if I go too fast, you kind of yawn if I'm going too slow. Um, so let, let, just start with some basic set of objects, omega. Um, what we need is some, a set of objects and some kind of ordering relation here. I'm using the logical symbol here because we're dealing with propositions, but so the, the, any kind of ordering or implication relation is what we require. And, and this is our sort of root structure. Okay. Then we, in a pair, a, a set of objects and an implication relation or an ordering option is called a lattice if every pair of objects in that thing has a supremum and an infimum in that set. Okay. So I'm hoping the notion of lattice is familiar to many people. But, if, but if, you, if you're used to working with sets, I mean, this is just a fancy way of saying that for every element in, in this set, the intersection of any two alternatives and the union of any two alternatives is in that set. And then you have what's called a lattice. And actually, uh, if for many reasons, it would be nice to start decision theory with lattices rather than Boolean algebras. Boolean algebras already have more structure than is terribly helpful. I mean, for instance, there are interesting structures like in quantum mechanics where we might want to do decision theory, but we don't have a Boolean algebra. So it would be nice to start earlier. I don't think it's too hard, actually, but as far as I know, nothing very interesting has been done in this. Uh, what's a Boolean algebra? Well, it's just a, a lattice that's distributive. So, the, 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 if you like, the intersection and union or the meet and join distributes and in which there's a complement inside, defined inside. That's all that a Boolean algebra is. Um, now, suppose we've got... Uh, we're, we're, now, we're now exclusively concerned with Boolean algebras. We won't look at anything weaker than that. So suppose you've got some set, which is in fact the set underlying a Boolean algebra, and we've got some element alpha in it, um, then uh, the principal ideal is just a set of objects underneath alpha, a set of things that imply alpha inside that Boolean algebra. Okay. We, call that the Boolean, we call that the principal ideal generated by alpha, and then this, this structure omega sub alpha, so those are, this is our, our new set of objects, with the implication relation restricted to that subject, is itself a Boolean algebra. It's just that it has a different unit. Its unit is not the, it's not the, uh, not the upper bound of the old one. It's now the, the object alpha. So uh, that's, our, that's a Boolean subalgebra of our original one. So these algebras come with nice nested structures. Um, we can go in the other direction. We're given two Boolean algebras. Then we can define their direct product by taking any object from the first and any object from the second, constructing an ordered pair, um, and then the set of all those ordered pairs, I mean the set of all sets of those ordered pairs, sorry, no, the set of all those ordered pairs is also a Boolean algebra. Okay. So we can go up and down with these things. Right? And, uh, that is going to give us more structure, actually. See. So two very important properties of Boolean algebras for the purpose of Volker's theory. Firstly, uh, yeah. 
some point what I want to do is start with a Boolean intro, take two principal ideals, and then to take their product. We don't get, we don't get only a backwards, we now get something that's a set of forward pairs. We get a product out there. Once we have that, that's when we can introduce separability into this one. So I, this is with an eye to saying what separability means. Now, what they find kind of confusing is you see alpha belongs to omega and beta belongs to omega. It's just the way that we know it. Yeah, it's an unhelpful. It's an unhelpful notation. It's unhelpful in some ways. It's helpful in the sense that you can fix on the step that belongs to it. Okay. Um, two properties that are going to match. So an atom of an algebra is something that uh, apply, implies other objects and except that it's not implied by anything else. And so it's, it's the maximally specific propositions in our An atom of algebra is one which contains no atoms other than the empty state. Uh, a computer algebra, uh, okay, so this is slightly more technical. So, a computer algebra is really one such that for any subset uh, of a set of objects, has a supreme and essential. Doesn't reflect that. I don't think that should matter. Alright, so atom of complete algebra, Boolean algebra is what we're going to be worrying about. Let me say something quickly though about. Preference relations on these countries. And so, what I'm just here is in a, is a special class of weak preference relations, which are going to be defined over these sets of propositions. And uh, our main concern here is with what's called an average relation. So, an average relation is just a preference relation, which is such that if you've got any two, pro two prospects that are disjoint, two pro disjoint propositions, then the conjunction of the union of those two propositions lies in between those two propositions in the preference. And the sense is a kind of flavor of the sugar in the principle. It's much weaker, but it's sort of the same kind of flavor. Because the idea is this. Suppose you have an action um, alpha or beta, like you, you can go to the beach and it's raining, or you can go to the beach and it's sunny. That's the strong possibility. How good is that possibility? Well, there's two ways it can come true. I can land up on the beach and it's raining. Oh, it's not the sunshine is too I can land up on the beach and it's sunny, or I can land up on the beach and it's raining. Um, you know, I prefer, this, I prefer the combination of sunshine and beach to rain and beach. Uh, what about the, the case where I don't know whether it's going to rain or, or, it's, or it's going to be sunny? Well, in the best case, I'm getting a sunny day on the beach. In the worst case, I'm getting a rainy day on the beach. I don't know whether I'm in the worst case or the best case, so my attitude works about some of the That's the idea of my So, is everybody in the next thing? Now, this acts in nothing. Um. So if we've got an averaging relation, then, then there are a couple of other properties that are important to it. Um, impartiality. Now, uh, impartiality is really doing the same work as P5 in, in Savage. It's what allows us to separate probability from desirability. So let me try and explain this slowly, see if we can understand. So suppose we have two prospects, alpha and beta, that are ranked together, right? And some third prospect, gamma, not ranked with either of alpha and beta. Um, suppose also that uh, this should say that alpha and gamma and beta and gamma are disjoint. Okay? So we're looking then at a comparison between alpha or gamma and beta or gamma, where these are just on both sides disjoint alternatives. Okay? And suppose it's the case that you're indifferent between these two as well. So you're indifferent between alpha and beta, and you're indifferent between alpha disjoint with gamma and beta disjoint with gamma. Now, intuitively, that's only going to be the case if um, uh, uh, this is only going to be the case if alpha and beta are probabilistically equivalent, have the same probability. Why? Well, suppose alpha was much more probable than beta, or more probable than beta. Right? Then, when you were looking at this option, 
then com as compared to this one, you're more likely to get alpha than you are likely to get beta when you get this option, right? Because averaging is telling you that these, the desirability of these things is a kind of average of the two ends of this thing. So when you compare these two averages, if their probabilities are different, it's, these averages are going to be weighted in one direction rather than another. But because they're indifferent, you know that they aren't weighted one more than one way than another. So you can, can conclude intuitively, right? I mean, this is the sort of backstory, that alpha and beta are probabilistically equivalent. Well, then it must be true for any such gamma that they're ranked together. So it's a... The impartiality is the condition which imposes um, coherence on the relationship between our desires and our beliefs. Right, so that's the work that it's doing here. Well, we need a continuity condition. I think I won't go through that. That's exactly what continuity conditions do, always do in these, in these things. Um, all right. Suppose we have a structure now consisting um, uh, of, a, of a set with an ordering relation, this, this is a, okay, a set with an ordering relation and a preference relation on that set. We're going to call it a bulk of structure, just in case uh, the underlying set and ordering relation is a complete Boolean, a, complete and atomless Boolean algebra, and this preference relation is an impartial and averaging relation on that. And that's a bulk, bulk of structure. Okay, so we're, now we're interested in, uh, messed up there. Ah, sorry, it should have been F prime is F with the contradiction removed, with the empty set removed. And I'll use the prime throughout as an indicator for the, the removal of the uh, empty set, and it's, yeah, for obvious technical reasons. All right, so now we want to say what kind of representations we can have of preferences on this structure, and then give the representations theorem. So we've seen the representations in a way, but this is in slightly more detail. Uh, a Jeffrey representation of a preference relation is really just a pair of functions, a probability, which satisfies the usual probability axioms. I guess those are familiar to everybody. Normality, non-negativity, and additivity. And a desirability function. There it's, if prime is properly defined for once. Um, satisfying two properties. Firstly, a normality condition. Optional, really, but uh, it makes the mathematics a whole lot easier. So we normalize with respect to the, the entire set. Um, and the desirability axiom. Well, this is just saying what we said before, that the desirability of any disjunction is a probability weighted average of the desirabilities of the two elements. In it. Okay. Such a pair of options um, is called a Jeffrey representation of the preference relation, just in case the desirabilities match up with the preferences. Okay. And now we have our representation theorem which is due to Bolker. Um, I'll tell you a nice story about it in a second. Let me set this here first. Okay, so suppose we have a Bolker structure, so named for obvious reasons now. Then, uh, there exists a Jeff Jeffrey representation of the preference relation. And furthermore, this, Jeffrey, this representation is unique up to fractional linear transformations. What's a fractional linear transformation? Well, um, suppose we have some other representation of V prime, P prime, then V prime is related to V by this ratio um, ratio of, of, uh, of desirabilities with two parameters in it, right? So we've got, we've got something that looks like the usual linear transforms at the top, and then we've got another linear transformation at the bottom. Remember, remember this, I, when I, at the, earlier on I said we could describe this as, as the ratio of two measures. I mean, if you want to understand why we get this uniqueness result, Think of it that, in this way, that we're getting uniqueness up to a fine linear, up to linear transformation both, for both of those measures. And so when we get the pair of them, we have a ratio. And this is called a fractional linear transformation. Uh, and then similarly, we have a transformation of the probabilities that's permitted, where we've got a transformation with, um, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, with something that contains a, uh, a desirability. So these are very, very strange objects here. And I think at least part of the explanation for um, the fact that the jeffrey Bolker system is not caught on is an inability to make sense of these, of these transformations. I mean, in part, it gives, you know, one of the worries here is that 
uh, is that strange things can happen. For instance, this, because of these, these transformations don't even preserve probabilistic orderings. So if on one probabilistic representation, alpha can be more probable than beta. You can do a transformation on it. You get another one that's equally good from the point of view of representing the preference ordering, but you get a reversal of the probabilistic ordering. So weird stuff can happen here. Um, and I think, I think there's understandably been some sort of worry about this. So we would like to say something about how we can get rid of it and what this, well, what this means and how we can get rid of it. Jeffrey himself was not at all interested in getting rid of it. Jeffrey's philosophical view was that beliefs and desires cannot be completely separated. And this just, I mean, this just represents the real world, that in a sense, beliefs and desires are idealizations of a much, much murkier mental world. He thought this you know, inseparability, if you like, was a positive feature of the theory. Not, not everybody is convinced by, by this. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, wishful thinking would be a good example illustrating the, the difficulty in distinguishing. But ethical beliefs are like that too. I mean, ethical beliefs are supposed to intrinsically motivate you, but they're beliefs. Um, so, so you know, it's not a mad story, I don't think. But we'll say something later about how you can reduce it, uh, reduce the, uh, I mean, you inc increase the uniqueness. So There's obviously some interest in it. Just to tell you the sort of backstory of this, so uh, uh, Ethan Volko was actually not, I mean, him and, and Jeffrey were at Princeton at the same time in the, in the 1960s. Jeffrey was working on his system. Jeffrey was looking for, as it were, a standard representation theorem. He thought you should be able to get unique probabilities and probabilities up to affine transformation and couldn't get anywhere. Volker was working on representations of quantum mechanical systems uh, and had got all this nice mathematics but had not been able to find any interesting applications. Uh, and both of them knew Gödel. Jeffrey went to speak to Kurt Gödel and asked Gödel if he could solve his problem. Gödel said, yeah, I probably can, but I don't need to because I think Volker has already solved your problem for you. And he put the two of them together and, hey, presto, you get the Volker. Volker Jeffrey system. Of the? further, so go ahead. Keep asking. Well, I think so. I, you know, I was just talking about the main definition of the other Because in the next slide, it's supposed to be defined by the other, right? It's... I mean, preference is defined on any. It's an average. It should be... So, well, it, should be, it, should be it should be restricted to F prime. So it's not defined on the on the end. All right, so that's the basic package. Um, I know you obviously don't have any time to look at any of the extensions, but let me just say something very quickly about um, how this works then. 
got a Boolean answer of propositions, you can start to ask, what are these propositions? Do these propositions have any particular structure? Um, and there's also lots of candidates here. There might be propositions about different people. Right? The propositions about different people. And the natural thing is to look at the subalgebras containing propositions that concern only one person. Right? And so you can split that into the subalgebras concerned with this. Oh, money, all the propositions concerned with each one respectively, and look at the product algebra of so those. And then I can ask whether these algebra are separable or not. Um, probably the answer in not two cases, because of course you're ending each other and each other and that sort of thing, so it's not separable, right? Uh, or you love each other, whichever way it is. But if I take, you know, the power and somebody living in Congo, possibly it's separable. Okay. And then I can ask myself, what, you know, what, is, what does it mean to be separable in this framework? Well, it just means that uh, if I look at the conjunction of any two propositions from one set to another set, uh, it doesn't affect the order. You can pair them without the order. So there's a very natural way to impose separability in this framework. And lo and behold, if you impose separability in this framework, you get an additive representation. Um, and in fact, it's, of course, because we're normalizing with respect to uh, a zero, uh, let's square out of that one group around. So we actually get, uh, we get a nice and neat thing. That's not the only sort of proposition we can look at. Uh, so now we're talking this morning about uh, the relationship between risk and ambiguity. It's a very natural way to treat that in this framework. We take look at propositions about probabilistic relations. So if you think that there are objective probabilities, it's called them chances. Well, then there are propositions about chances. These are things that you can believe or disbelieve. They're things you can find desirable or not desirable. Um, we can have Boolean algebras of such propositions, and we can ask what's the structure of these things. Surprise, surprise. We have some kind of linearity condition on such a set. We'll get an Morgenstern representation. That's also a Jeffrey representation. But we can do something much weaker than that. Impose much weaker relations because we can uh, we can ask you know what's the what's the relationship between your attitude to these chancy propositions and non chancy propositions. We can do things like say uh, if the chances of the coin man heads is one half, then you rationally require to believe to degree one half the coin of the land heads. Uh, that's a relationship between objective and subjective probability that's impossible to express in the standard framework. Down in a second, but which is very easy to express. And so, so, you know, you can play with it as much as you like, and you can knowledge, and dynamics, and so on. Um, uh, but uh, you pull the way along, you carry with yourself this sort of underlying structure which, which provides the, the discipline. Okay, so that's the, that's the case for the uh, prosecution. <laughs> So in a sense, so in a sense, the setup is uh, more, fun, more fundamental than Savage. No? Uh, so I was wondering uh, how can Savage can be embedded? Okay. So are there kind of? Uh, you tell me. Yeah, no, it's very easy. So uh, very like the story about uh, separability across persons. You just look at uh, the relationship between your attitude to risk and the proposition of your set of propositions. So these are the events that you're interested. Suppose it's the states of the weather, right? So you look at a partition, rain, snow, and so on. Look at the principal ideals under each of those. Right? That gives you these a family of subalgebras concerned with what happens in e under each event. Then you take the direct product of all of those, and now you have a, a, a big Boolean algebra that consists of these integrals, right? Now we're really already at savage, just about at savage acts because we've got, you know, what our, obj what our propositions look like are just these entiples where each element is pulled out of one of these subalgebras. So the probability of each sub <coughs> Because somehow you expect that the, the probability of uh, a, a, a proposition so identified. Uh, yeah. So somehow only a probability, not uh, desirability. So there should be a. Sort of a syntactic way to 
um, to decompose uh, in the sense that uh, then you have just the probability of so alpha should be decomposing some uh, same sort of an operation between uh, uh, say gamma and beta such that the probability of alpha is just uh, the probability of gamma the desirability of alpha is the desirability of beta right. uh, so you decompose somehow the, the, the yeah. right. So, but so in a syntactic way, not just no. Invoking. I don't think it's a syntactic way. If I'm understanding your, what you're saying correctly, is that um, we, we're going to have to be very careful. So each of these subalgebras, as it were, will carry their own pairs of probability and desirability functions, right? So, so you, you, you will have an indexed family of Boolean algebras with an indexed family of Jeffrey representations that go with them. Mm -hmm. And then you take the product algebra, and that will have its own big daddy representation. And then you can ask what's, you know, we, we need to be sure that these things are, co are coherent. At the level of probability functions, this will be like, this will just be a marginalization condition. The, the point will have, to, yeah, so the, the big daddy probability function will have to have the sub ones as its marginals on each of the sub algebras. I'm out for, for the. Uh, no. No, I just wondering. The, 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 so I suppose I, I, I want to have a first chapter using Jeff and say, and then say, okay, now let's suppose that there is some uh, that eventually will be some sort of state independence, whatever, yeah. down the road, but in a syntactic way. So on the Boolean algebra, some condition that allow me to decompose uh, ah. and then uh, get from that those elements somehow the the savage. Uh, yeah. Uh, so a genuine probability, uh, utility, uh, so somehow the decomposition yeah. that you claim that, as you are right, that often isn't, isn't there, but right. you can think of situation where it is. Yeah, I'm not sure that, uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about a syntactic condition. That's the, uh, uh, there, is, there will be a condition. I mean, essentially you're looking for a partition which is such that you've got probabilistic independence of the conditions from the thing and desirabilistic independence within. Yeah, so you can state that as a semantic condition, but I'm not sure that you can state it as a syntactic condition. That's the... That's the, the question. Yeah, I mean, so... I, I, and I, I think... I mean, I, actually, I think that's right because I think this decomposition, if you like, is subjective. So, it's again, to take the, the shaman versus me, I mean, when we look at our act space, uh, we can both be savage decision makers, but our space of acts will be look very differently, and that's because we're performing. So yes, maybe in terms of the of the preference, definitely. Uh, so it isn't there? Uh, so because that would be a very nice uh, way to. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I I have such a thing uh, stated semantically. So and and so th there are. Um, and in fact, you can get a set of conditions that because of the Boolean structure is strictly weaker than the savage ones, but which give you, I mean, so you get an intermediate, which is you can get a state independent version of savage. So you get separability, but, but state dependence still. And then you can go the final step and actually get a state independent formulation if you want as well. Um, same with the Anscombe Allman. If you put the chance propositions in, you can get an Anscombe Allman representation in which you can vary the two components. I mean, so you, if you wanted to reproduce KMM, for instance, you know, you, you would look for representations that gave you concave transformations of the, of, the, of the von Neumann on the chance propositions, but with a sort of standard savage style. That would be the idea. But there's lots to play with. I mean, you know, honestly, there's so much work to be done here. I think there's, uh, people are looking for PhD topics. <laughs> May I suggest that we take further questions to coffee and I may, may I suggest physicists in the audience to address the question of what quantum mechanics got to do with this over coffee with you because I suppose that's what they all have in mind and we have a few physicists in the room so be prepared let's thank Richard again thanks very much